morning. morning. It's so great to be here on this stage. Um, I'm, going to I'm going to tell you a story about privacy today, because privacy is something that I care very deeply about. And you know, as a kid, as a kid, reading George Orwell's 1984, I was fascinated to see this uh, dystopian world in which every citizen would be watched by their government through these telescreens, which were essentially these fictional devices that were somewhere in between TV sets and surveillance cameras. And the thing was, every citizen, uh, it was mandatory for them to have such a TV screen in, uh, in their living rooms. Now, when I look around the world in which we live in nowadays and the way that we surround ourselves with uh, smart devices that have microphones, that have cameras, and um, <clears throat> that are always connected to the internet, I don't see much difference between the world we live in nowadays and George Orwell's dystopian uh, novel. The only difference being that we were the ones to buy these TV sets, took them to our living rooms, and installed them there um, ourselves. So this is going to be a talk about privacy in the digital age. But before we start talking about privacy, I'll have to take you back a little bit into the past. And I'd like to try to make you imagine a world without borders, a world in which the human beings managed to evolve because of one main reason, which was migration. And of course, you all know the story of the ancient Silk Road. It was this trading route connecting more than three, uh, connecting three continents. And all of the civilizations on the path of this trading route, they managed to evolve because uh, they had the possibility, the opportunity to exchange goods, to exchange merchandise. But even more important than that, they had the opportunity to exchange ideas, to exchange philosophies about you know, things such as religion, life, um, <clears throat> or science. So Silk Road was the thing that opened these uh, long-distance political and economic relationships between these um, countries, uh, civilizations. And the same principles of having an open uh, world, a world in which anything can be shared, stood at the core of the Internet, because when the Internet was founded, when the Internet was invented, it all started as a research project made by people in uh, universities, technical people, researchers. And what they wanted was a way in which they could share their information freely and in a timely manner, to essentially you know, take science to the, uh, to the next level. Now, what happened back then was, because this was a very small project started inside the universities, all of these people, they knew each other and they trusted each other. So when they designed the Internet, they didn't think of things such as security and privacy. And uh, these two things were added only later, on top of an already shaky foundation. Um, <clears throat> and this is why we have so many problems with security and privacy in the world that we live in nowadays. If we fast forward to the present date, we live right now in a world in which borders are everywhere. Borders are ubiquitous, and we not only take these borders for granted, but we got used with them. You know, every time we travel, we're used to going through security checks in, um, in airports. We're used to staying in queues for um, um, security guards to check our passports. But what gives me hope is that when looking at the human civilization, I see that we're not okay with any type of border that is imposed on us. And sometimes we like to jump over some walls, and sometimes we even take these walls down. And I think that the Berlin Wall is a great example of how um, <clears throat> people manage to, uh, uh, to become free if they really want it. And the thing that worries me right now is that Less than three decades after the Berlin Wall collapsed and uh, put an end to an era of division between the East and the West, the world right now seems to be on the brink of making the same mistakes over again. Only this time, we're doing these mistakes in the cyberspace. And what I mean about this is that the Internet right now is going through a process which is called balkanization. Now, balkanization is a geopolitical term, and it is used to define the process in which a certain uh, area 
is becoming divided into smaller entities. And these smaller entities are not only hostile to each other, but they usually refuse to cooperate with each other. So, of course, the Internet naturally has a tendency to be divided, and this is happening because we all have differences in things like language or culture. So, while in this part of the world we're all browsing the, let's say, let's call it the English-speaking Internet, in other parts of the world, maybe a Chinese speaker will not use Google to do searches, but they will use Baidu. A Russian-speaking person will not use Google, they will use Yandex. And this division is okay, because it's all natural. And the thing is, information is kind of like water. It has the tendency to, you know, to leak or to go to any place which it can reach. So just like two communicating vessels will get filled by the same source of water, the same way the Internet is helping human civilization to share knowledge and to uh, disseminate this knowledge all over the world. But unfortunately, not everyone is okay with this. What is happening nowadays is that more and more countries are building walls on the Internet. And I think a good example to illustrate this story is the story of the Great Firewall of China. Uh, I'm not sure if many of you have been to China, but if you go to China nowadays, you'll realize that most of the websites that you are used with browsing every day are blocked in China, so you're totally not allowed to access them. And this is happening for a long while. What actually happened in China was that <clears throat> the Internet entered China in 1994. And the Chinese part, the Communist Party back then, was very quick to realize that this new network has the potential and the power to bring like-minded people together and to make them uh, work together to, uh, <clears throat> to get some changes. And of course, the Communist Party has seen this as a threat to their uh, power. So only three years later, in 1997, the Great Firewall of China, its first version actually, was already up and running and operational, filtering traffic and monitoring people's access to the Internet. And when there's a website which they cannot block, what they will do is they will try to compel that company to remove certain content or to change the way that results are being displayed to Chinese users. So for example, if you would search uh, uh, for pictures of the Tiananmen Square event on the Chinese internet, you would just see pictures of a clear blue sky and some nice uh, you know, Asian architecture. If you do the same Google search from anywhere else in the world, what happens is you will see the famous Tank Man picture, which became a symbol of the, of the revolution. And the problem is that um, <clears throat> the problem is that China is not the only place in which this is happening. China was just the first country to um, to start this trend. And what's worrying me is that in the past two decades, more and more countries started following this uh, this trend. <clears throat> the problem is that there's a real you know, technical industry that is fueling the growth of Internet surveillance. Every year, more and more companies uh, are being uh, started up, and the only thing that they do is they try to figure out new ways in which governments can monitor our um, online communications. And I think this, uh, that this is pretty, uh, uh, pretty bad and pretty, uh, pretty wor worrying. Um, <clears throat> another interesting thing is that whenever a certain government cannot use their own mass surveillance capabilities to get their hands on certain information, what they will do is they will legally co compel internet-based companies to give them their data. And some of these companies are actually publishing these uh, requests and statistics about requests from governments. And what we can see is that more and more Silicon Valley-based companies, which are taking care of the internet, are very often choosing to comply with requests coming from authoritarian regimes or, for example, regimes that don't have a very good track record when it comes to um, respecting the human rights. And this is, I think, a very worrying trend. <clears throat> now, maybe the Chinese example uh, is not something that will touch you, because, you know, China is very far away and we don't really care about what's happening there. But I'd like you to try to travel to a place which is more closer to our home, which is Turkey, a country in our area. And I'd like you to meet Barış Pehlivan. Barış Pehlivan is a, an investigative journalist based in Turkey. And he's a journalist who's been very critical of the government in the past few years. Now, 
very recently, Barish was released uh, from prison, where he spent more than one year and a half after his office was raided and the government found certain incriminating files on his hard drive. Now, what actually happened here was that Barish was not the one to put those files on his hard drive. Uh, the weekend before his arrest, somebody broke into his office on a Friday night when nobody was there and when his computer was turned off. They physically removed the hard drive from his computer, planted the files there and put the, the hard drive back. Now, this was uncovered, this, these conclusions were uncovered by cybersecurity researchers who did this uh, forensic investigation on Borish's uh, hard drive. And another thing that they uncovered was that in the previous weeks before his arrest, his computer was attacked 12 times with Ahtapot, which uh, means octopus in Turkish. And it's one of the most sophisticated pieces of malware that the world has ever seen. And cybersecurity researchers are thinking that the origins of this malware comes for, from Turkey. But the reason why I wanted to tell you Borish's story is that I want you to understand the dangers that um, <clears throat> there are when somebody else has access to your data, when somebody else has access to your computer. It's not just a question of knowing information about yourself, but it's also, it can be a question of freedom, you know. And I think that this is a very important thing because nowadays malware is everywhere and cybersecurity researchers are analyzing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of new malicious files every day. Now, of course, only the tip of the iceberg is represented by malware designed for governments uh, to attack Internet users. But even the rest of the malware, 90% of the malware, which is mostly responsible for you know, financial losses, you have to understand that as long as a computer virus has complete and total access to the information on your computer, they can essentially control your lives. And it doesn't have to be a government who wants to go after you. It can just be a, you know, a bored teenager who is your neighbor and uh, uh, wants to attack you, or you know, why not even your spouse who is suspicious on, suspicious on you and they will buy some off-the-shelf commercial, commercial spyware and they will install it on your phone or um, on, uh, on your computer. The positive thing, the really good thing, is that not all hackers are bad. Not all hackers write malware and want to infect your computer. There's actually a pretty decent amount of good hackers out there. We like to call ourselves cybersecurity researchers. And we like to look our, at ourselves as being the doctors of the cyber world. And just like doctors don't care about borders, and whenever, for example, there's a doctor in a conflict area, they will treat that patient no matter if that patient is a soldier or a civilian. They will treat that patient no matter on which side of the border that patient is, the same thing cybersecurity researchers are doing nowadays, being neutral in the face of cyber threats, targeting our security and targeting uh, our privacy. And I think this is a very important thing, because if you look at the world map of freedom of the press, you can see that the same areas in the world in which the internet is censored and surveilled are the same areas in which journalism doesn't have a very good uh, uh, freedom track record, so to say. And, you know, you don't have to read an Oxford study to realize that whenever a person is being surveilled, uh, they will change their behavior. And I think that this is very dangerous when it comes to journalists, because the moment when a journalist starts inflicting self-censorship on himself, then he is depriving all of us of very good information that we need in order to make our decisions. And, you know, even though this study is, uh, is available, and I'm sure that none of you will read it, I just want you to spend a moment and think if you've ever had the situation in which you wrote a Facebook status update, and then you decided not to post it because you just had a quick thought that maybe somebody will see your status update and they will think something bad about you. This is, I think, the very basic example of self-censorship, and it's a very dangerous um, thing. Now, just as self-censorship affects our intellect, internet censorship can affect our wallet, our economies. Because right now, the internet is responsible for more than 21% of growth in GDP in, uh, in, uh, in modern countries. And I think that we need not to ignore this, uh, this trend, the fact that the internet can bring prosperity to, um, uh, to the people. And just like the ancient Silk Road story, 
brought prosperity to the civilizations that were on the, this trading path on these three continents. The modern Silk Road brought prosperity to Ross Ulbricht, who was a computer programmer and an extreme libertarian. And in 2011, this guy decided that he needs to set up Silk Road, which was an underground marketplace where anything and everything could be traded. So this was, website essentially became something like the Amazon of um, uh, illegal things. Um, Russell Ulbricht really believed that it's up to every human being to choose uh, what things they want to buy, what substances they want to use. So his website eventually ended up being the number one go-to place for anyone who wanted to buy things like guns or fake IDs or why not dangerous drugs. So of course, his website attracted the attention of law enforcement uh, who seized his website and arrested Ross Ulbricht in 2015. Um, once he was arrested, everybody realized that this guy became very rich. Uh, he earned more than, more than 100 millions of dollars uh, just by taking commissions from all of these illegal trading that's happening there. So there's no doubt that the internet is something that we need if we want to become prosper and if we want our civilizations to evolve. And we need an internet which is free and open and everybody can access it. But maybe sometimes, you know, total freedom is not what we need because when people have total freedom, they might have uh, uh, bad ideas. The thing is, I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to judge if total freedom is good or bad, and I'm not here to judge if mass surveillance is good or bad. The only thing what, that I can tell you for sure is that we, as human beings, want to evolve. And the only way in which we can evolve is if we have real choice, if we can make real choices about what we want to do with our lives. And there cannot be anything like real choice as long as we don't have access to real information. And the reason why I'm very worried right now is that governments around the world have already decided what kind of internet they want for themselves. They want an internet in which everybody is monitored and all the content is controlled. And I think that this is the moment when we have to make the same choice and we the people have to decide what kind of internet do we want our kids to use in the future. Do we want it to be like George Orwell's novel, 1984, when everybody's being watched and surveilled by the government? Or do we want our kids to live in a future in which digital privacy and security is a basic human right and it's something that everybody needs to have? I think this is the question that I'd like to leave you with, and I'd like to thank you for paying attention.